10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Can anybody hear me now? All right. It looks maybe we solved the problem. So anyway, all right, good. So I'm back. It looks like I had a little technical glitch to start the show. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of give my introduction again really quickly. So welcome to the John DeVito Show. Uh, my name is John DeVito. And as you know, I've talked about many, many times. I live currently in the state of Massachusetts. And I grew up in the beautiful state of New Hampshire. I have a lot of friends in New Hampshire, a lot of family in New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, in my opinion, is one of the most beautiful states in the country. I love the people of New Hampshire, very independent thinking, strong-willed people. And I know a lot of you have talked about me over the years and my personality. I got that from my upbringing in the state of New Hampshire. So I am super excited today to be interviewing uh, Max Abramson. He is a member of the New Hampshire House of Representatives. We should be hearing from him very shortly. He's going to be calling into our show. And he's going to be talking about a new bill in the state of New Hampshire, which is labeled as HB 138. And it's going to be very interesting to hear about him. And it looks like we have Max calling in right now. So let me answer this call and we're going to get him on the line. So Max, if you can hear me, welcome to the show. Oh, Max, are you there? Max, are you there? Okay, it looks like he's connecting. I'm not sure if he's having trouble with his headphones. But we'll give him a second. Max, can you hear me? Hello, Max. How are you? Can you hear me? Okay, we are waiting to see if we can get Max worked out. He has called in. If we can't get him here on the live, I may have to call him directly. I'm just checking to see if he's texting us. He looks like he's... Uh, connected in. Um, Max, can you hear us at all? 
Yeah, unfortunately, we can't hear you, Max. So I see Max is in the chat, and we will see if we can get him worked out. Maybe, Max, if you remove yourself from the call-in area and call back in, we could hopefully get you in. Yeah, Eric made a comment. He said you might be muted on your Bluetooth, so you might want to check that to see if you've maybe muted yourself. And we'll get you on eventually. We'll get it worked out. Let's see. Okay, he ended his call. So we'll give Max a second to call back in, and we'll see if this works out, maybe the technical difficulties that we're having. All right, All right Max, we are reconnected. Can you hear me? I can hear some movement, but I can't hear Max speaking. Hello, Max, are you there? Go ahead. Oh, I got you. There you are. Hey, Max, how are you? Okay, well, it looks like my uh, audio setup wasn't working. That's all right. Okay, well, we got you. We got you on now, loud and clear. So, uh, you missed the you know, the beginning of uh, my introduction, and I had told uh, the people coming in right now. We've got a pretty full chat already of people coming in, so I've introduced you as Max Abramson. You are a member of the New Hampshire House of Representatives, and as I've said to the people in here, you know, I've got a lot of close friends that come into the show. I have a lot of listeners throughout the state of New Hampshire, a lot of friends in New Hampshire. My wife and I are both from you know Atkinson and Salem, respectively. And when I heard about what you were introducing, you know, in the state, this new uh, bill that's uh, been introduced, and I guess there were hearings on Wednesday, it really caught my attention. And I'd like to certainly give you a chance to maybe get on and tell my listeners a little bit about yourself first. You know, I've read quite a bit about you over the last couple of days, and uh, you're a very, you know, very impressive guy. I see that you ran for president at one point during your career, and uh, you've had a very successful career in politics. And uh, I'd like to maybe give you a chance to tell us a little bit more about yourself, the person, and then we can go into maybe talking about this new bill that will hopefully get passed in the state of New Hampshire. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Max? Um, I dropped out of politics a few years ago um, for a couple of reasons. Um, I, I kind of lost faith in the system, and I, I was talking to uh, some of our armed service veterans about uh, the issue of veteran suicides. We still had 22 veteran suicides a day. And I was looking at the, the treatment that our veterans were getting at the VA and through the, through the system and how they're being treated by the criminal justice system. And I, I felt like I couldn't just sit by and do nothing. So I kind of at the last minute decided to throw my name in again, just one more time for state house. And I not only won, but I, I won by a pretty good margin and I've, I've gotten elected and reelected uh, a couple of times since. And uh, just as an aside, I, I put in a house resolution asking the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs and, and Congress to hold hearings to investigate the causes of veteran suicides. And just about two weeks ago, the, uh, the uh, Veterans Affairs Committee passed that unanimously. It went to the consent calendar and it, it was passed and uh, just last uh, uh, Wednesday and became law. And, and now hopefully we'll get, uh, get some action on that. Well, that's great. You know, I, I was looking up uh, some of the things you have going on. And in addition to this, you have several other uh, articles right now that are pending. And you certainly you're doing your part to come in and really make some, you know, some positive changes in the state of New Hampshire. And I love what you just said about veterans, because you're going to find in my show, we have a lot of people in here that come in and we are very pro veteran. And we a lot of us feel sometimes that maybe our voices aren't being heard, you know, by the government. So to have you come into the show really is a big thing for all of us. And uh, we're very excited to have you in and to hear that you're an advocate of the people that, you know, give us our freedom and fight for our freedom on a daily basis. I mean, to me, that's amazing to hear and really a very, a very positive thing. Now, what, what made you, you said you would run a few times or you actually had taken your hat out of the political ring. You had maybe lost faith a little bit. What caused you to come back in and try to, you know, run for office again. And, you know, obviously it was great that you did because you won, but what, what made you get back into it? Uh, I think about 2016, I, I think it might've even been right at the filing deadline. Um, I decided to just throw my name in again. Um, it was mainly veterans issues, but actually a little bit of an aside, I work in software development, I work in road construction. And sometimes when I'm working on detail with the, the police detail, um, I'll bring some of these issues up. A lot of them are armed service veterans. And one of the officers was talking about the high rate of, of suicides by EMTs, uh, firefighters, rescue workers, and police officers. And, and I'd never heard of that before. And he said, you know, it might be PTSD or any number of issues, you know, near-death experiences when you have uh, 
you know, the adrenaline is running and the fight or flight response kicks in. Um, it's supposed to kick in once in a great, great while. It's not supposed to kick in like a couple of times a week. You're not supposed to kind of go into that mental state. So that might be causing um, some of the mental wear and tear. I mean, any human being, you've only got you've only got so much capacity to deal with the stress. Eventually the stress is just going to reach a point where people can develop PTSD, depression. Um, it can cause uh, serious problems at home. When you go home and you're getting injured or, or a broken arm or, or peed on by people or shot at um, and the high speed chases and seeing people die. Um, eventually the, it, it seems like there's something about the, the smell of that blood, human blood, when you get to the, the scene, you see it, it's one thing when we drive past a, a, an accident scene, but it seems like when human beings are exposed to the smell, the smell of blood, the, the sense of, of smell is the only sense that bypasses all the other filters in your brain. And when you smell something, you have, it doesn't matter what you're thinking or what your mental state is, um, and you keep getting exposed to that over and over and over again. Um, it seems that that seems to have some kind of direct impact on people's thinking that it just, it just continues to increase the stress. Um, we see that in combat veterans a lot, um, what they used to call shell shock, uh, except they had soldiers who were not being exposed to artillery. Uh, and they were still developing this PTSD. They were still developing some disorders and they would go back home and they, they just couldn't readjust to civilian life. Um, and we're not sure what the, the connection is or the chemical connection or if it's something that's instinctive, uh, but they can't go back to a kind of civilized uh, society very easily and they can't readjust. And we see all sorts of problems, substance abuse, uh, suicide attempts, depression, um, very, very high levels. You know, it may have to do with the fact that a lot of these people are type A personalities going in, but there's something about the stress of combat and seeing people die frequently that, that seems to contribute to a lot of the stress and, and, and emotional breakdowns. I mean, I can't even imagine. I mean, I'm a guy, I've never served in combat. And honestly, at times that's been one of the regrets in my life. I mean, I was, you know, I was a college football player. I was a guy that really kind of, you know, enjoyed being in the middle of things. And, and really, I, I think I've always felt in a way that maybe I missed the boat in not serving my country because I do come from a family that, uh, you know, we have a lot of military veterans in my family, on both sides of my family. And I can't even imagine the type of stress that these people are under during, you know, combat like they are. But, you know, to, to talk about another point you were just talking about as well regarding the EMTs and the medical professionals, I can speak, you know, a little bit on this because I'm married to a wife who's in healthcare and she's a doctor and she has been, you know, dealing with this COVID thing for the last year. And not just, not just even that, but I mean, she, you know, she used to deliver babies and she would have, you know, she would lose babies. I mean, there, there were all different types of things that would happen to her, you know, lose patients that she's had for a very long time. And, you know, for me, when I have a bad day, okay, maybe I don't get a big deal for work or whatever, but when she has a bad day, you know, people are dying and she's losing people that she's worked with, you know, for years. So the stress that these people endure, you're right. It, it's just something that most people cannot comprehend. And I think it's very difficult for a lot of them to, to come back from. So I think it's kind of great that you've been involved in, you know, doing a lot of these things to hopefully, you know, help some of these people maybe, um, you know, get back on track and, and get past some of the, some of the issues because they've been involved in such, you know, very severe uh, circumstances. So, you know, but before we get the, too far into the podcast, I want to ask you a little bit about, you know, HB 138. So you are putting forward or you've already put forward and you, there'll be hearings very shortly on this new bill in New Hampshire that will allow people who have been convicted of serious crimes and have gotten life without the possibility of parole, this will allow these people who are in prison for life to have a parole hearing after they've been in for 25 years. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, how did you get to the point where you thought that this would be something that uh, the state of New Hampshire would benefit from? And why do you feel that people who have been sentenced, you know, life without the possibility of parole deserve a parole hearing after 25 years. I guess, I guess what's your motivation behind this? Wrongful convictions. Uh, 25 years ago, the forensic methods that were being used and the police interrogation methods that were being used um, have all been subject to scrutiny and none of them have held up. So we've had, uh, I think Innocence Project looked at their first batch of cases and they found 
that of all these cases where people maintain their innocence, 57% of the people who maintained their innocence, when they were able to do DNA testing, fingerprinting, uh, find video, find other evidence, they were able to absolutely prove 57% of the time that that person was not the person who did it. And on top of that, Innocence Project, most people don't know this, their single biggest cost, by far, almost half their budget, is after they've proven people innocent, it takes an average of eight more years, and sometimes it's taken as much as 13 years, after they've proven someone innocent to get them out of prison. People think that you prove someone innocent and they, and they go out the very next day. You know, they, they, they pack their toothbrush and walk out of the prison toothbrush in hand. And it, it doesn't happen that way. It's years and years and years after, you know, someone might have gotten a 20-year prison sentence and they've already served 12 years on a 20-year prison sentence. And people think, well, they'll let them out, won't they? No, prosecutors fight and fight and fight to keep innocent people in prison for as long as they possibly can. Even when uh, 148 of Innocence Project's cases 148 times they found the real killer, and in some cases they can't prosecute the real killer or the real rapist because they're holding on to, you know, the wrong person. Whatever facts are found by a jury, uh, uh, Seventh Amendment of the Constitution says cannot be brought into question by any court in the land except by the rules of common law. So common law puts a lot of legal process restrictions on what you're allowed to do. And the courts will just, the, the prosecutors will just file motion after motion after motion to keep innocent people trapped in prison for another eight years. So I thought, well, you have all these cases where there's reasonable doubt. You have cases even where someone has been proven innocent. Why not have the parole hearing, the parole hearings every couple of years? Why not have the parole hearing uh, just as kind of a backup? when someone's been either proven innocent or the real killer comes forward or there's some reasonable doubt or the forensic method that they use to, to convict some of these people. Um, the forensic methods that were used back as late as the late 1990s, early aught decade, they have every single one except for nuclear DNA testing. When uh, Congress put out this um, eight year long study, uh, surveying every single forensic method, every single one fell into problems. It was all either junk science or they, the methods were being done improperly. There wasn't corroboration by another forensic expert. Um, but Innocence Project, as much as they found problems with prosecutorial misconduct, they found just as often that the public defender or the criminal defense attorney didn't do much of a job uh, cross-examining the forensic experts or didn't cross-examine the forensic experts at all. I mean, that's amazing to me to hear from you. I mean, I, you know, I'm a guy that, you know, I, I'm 53 years old. I've been around for a bit. And to hear that states will actually knowingly keep people who are have been proven innocent in prison. I mean, that that is something that's new to me. It's shocking to me. And, uh, man, I, I, I don't even know how to respond to that. I mean, that's terrifying to think that you may be in prison. It's been proven that someone else committed the crime, but you are going to remain in prison, maybe sometimes up to eight years, as you mentioned, without anyone really in your corner looking to get you out. I mean, how often does that happen? Does that happen on a regular basis or? About one third of inmates either maintain their innocence or they accept responsibility for a lesser offense. So this is another one where someone is convicted of first degree homicide. They get life without parole. And, but actually they accept second degree or reckless homicide or negligent homicide where they should be getting 10 years or 20 years, but now 25 years has passed and uh, uh, applying a, a little more scrutiny to their case, you, you kind of wonder why did these jurors convict them of, you know, first degree homicide? There's no evidence of premeditation or there's no evidence that they did committed the crime purposely. They might've done so recklessly and they would certainly deserve 10 or 20 years or um, an accomplice case. Um, about half of these really long 30, 40, 50 year sentences are nonviolent drug possession cases. And we're passing legislation right now. Um, in fact, there was a hearing today to, to reduce the penalties associated with drug possession, you know, from 30 years to 15 years or some such thing. But yet these people who are serving essentially effectively life without possibility of parole, they don't get the chance to have a parole hearing. Some of them get get it at 18 years, um, but a lot of them get no uh, 
no parole hearing ever. There's never a possibility for them to have their sentence shortened. And, you know, I want to mention for those, for those people in the chat, I see a lot of comments coming in. I may get to a couple of those. I see one that I would, I do want to mention to Max in a moment, but just so a lot of you know, for the people in the chat that are not from New Hampshire and for the people that listen to this podcast after, after the fact, you know, Max is a conservative and I'd like to see that we have a conservative that's actually coming out with this bill and looking to, you know, promote something hopefully that will, you know, save families and people who have been wrong, wrongfully committed a lot of heartache and a lot of time, you know, in prison. So I mean, it's, it's good to see that you're here because I, you know, I know my state of New Hampshire, in my state of New Hampshire, we have a lot of independent people. We have a lot of conservatives in the state of New Hampshire. And I will admit that growing up in that state is, it has given me a lot of my determination in my life. And I know that the people in New Hampshire are very strong willed people. Now, do you feel that, you know, you're going to have bipartisan support on this bill, or do you think it's going to be an uphill battle as you move this thing forward at this point? There's bipartisan support when we try to do criminal justice reform, and there's also bipartisan opposition. Um, right. We've had a number of bills where, unfortunately, it's, it's either a few Democrats or it's a few Republicans supporting it. Um, some of it is we were successful a few years ago, about 10 years ago, at finally removing mandatory minimum sentencing. That's, that's just a relic of the, the dark ages, as far as I'm concerned, where you have a judge looking at a case saying, hey, here's a first-time offender, um, or it's just nonviolent uh, you know, firearms possession or uh, drug possession charge or, or something that's, that's a one-time accident, and the, and the guy's getting three and a half years behind bars or six years or 10 years behind bars. And they, they, they don't, uh, they don't have any way out. And we managed to get bipartisan support to remove mandatory minimum sentencing. And it's lucky that that happened. Now judges have a little more discretion where you have somebody who obviously shouldn't be run through, you know, the revolving door prison system where they start getting involved in violent prison gangs and whatnot. And what we found is the recidivism rate is so bad in New Hampshire and some other States that they're sending people who really aren't criminals uh, and they're not of a criminal mindset. It's just 30, 40 years old for the first time ever. They do something that's in violation of law. Who knows it's, you know, some drugs on their boat that they're bringing into the Harbor as just kind of a one time stupid thing. And, and the judge is saying, well, wait a minute, we don't really want to, we don't want to run these people through the prison industry. And you start running people through over and over and over again. And they, they come out dangerous criminals nonviolent, non-dangerous people, ordinary law-abiding citizens who screw up in some terrible way, and then you put them in prison, and when they come out, all of a sudden they're covered in prison tattoos and they're just for survival, and they, you know, they join a prison gang. And now... Okay, I think we lost Max for a second there. I'll give him a second. It looks like maybe we lost his uh, signal. Oh, there you go. Okay, you're back. Go ahead. Somebody tried to call me. Um, okay, it happens. <laughs> yeah, so you'll, you'll have somebody who isn't dangerous, then they run them through the prison industry, and they come out, and all of a sudden they've got no prospects for for uh, work. Um, and everyone knows they've somebody spent three, four, five years in prison, or 10 or 20 years in prison, and nobody wants to hire you. And that's happened with a lot of wrongful conviction cases. Only compensation you get in the completely bizarre, totally fortuitous strike of luck. If you do, if you're wrongly convicted, if you're able to get out in New Hampshire, be proven innocent, you get $20,000 in compensation total. After your lawyers have been working for 10, 12, 15 years on your case, and I think Innocence Project spends an average, I think their median time is like 13 years. 13 years uh, time served um, for people who are wrongly convicted. And your legal bills are going to be 10 times that, five to 10 times that easily, just just filing motions to try to get uh, exculpatory evidence considered. Now, how, I mean, what would you say to the people in New Hampshire that say that would come out and say, well, you know, they committed the crime. They have to do the time. They got life without the possibility of parole. That is the sentence they received. Why should we support a bill now to give potential criminals who committed serious crimes such as murder a chance to get out of prison if they were sentenced in that manner back in the day why should we now give them a chance to get out uh well 
it wouldn't be a chance to get out for most of your, you know, your actual murderers who haven't done anything to reform themselves and they're just hardened criminals. And sometimes they're two and three and four time repeat offenders. Those people would not get out. Uh, I don't, I can't imagine any parole uh, board member recommending parole for that. Um, but in, in those cases, I would say that it, it actually kind of makes sense to have not just the judge sentence them to life, but to have a parole board look at their case 25 years later in the light of, of, of new evidence. And if that person really is a, 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 a cold-blooded murderer, they kind of need more people saying, hey, what you did, even though it um, uh, may not have been premeditated, um, that your motivation for doing it wasn't good enough and to have objectively someone else saying, look, this was this was first degree intentional homicide. You killed somebody intentionally and you should serve life in prison, that you are the exemplary case why we have life in prison. Um, but I, I, I said at the hearing, there are some people of these, uh, I think, 180 or 190 people total behind bars for. Um, serving life in prison without possibility of parole in New Hampshire. Out of 4,000 total, about 190 are serving life without parole. Uh, that was um, actually so my next is, question. So I'm, yeah, I'm glad you said that. I was going to ask that next. So it, it's that many people that this would affect. And, um, geez, that's amazing. So you've got 100, roughly 190 people that are in this circumstance. So if this were to pass, then each of these people, once they have been in for 25 years, they would get the chance to have a parole hearing. Now, what if someone has been in there already for – you know, 30, 35 years, would they immediately get a parole hearing or when would that parole hearing happen for people that have already surpassed that 25 year time frame? They would, they would retroactively get a parole hearing. And then once you are kind of in the parole system, you get every, every few years, you get to go in front of a parole hearing um, again. So those people would at least um, get to have a hearing. Part of the reason for doing this is for a correctional officer safety, but all part of the reason is, to take lifers, these 180 or so individuals, and kind of create an incentive for them to be on good behavior, to reform themselves, take the classes, the counseling, um, admit their wrongdoing, and go through the process of reform. Not necessarily have, ever have a realistic chance of parole, but at least to have some outside chance of parole rather than just kind of being thrown away by society. Um, right. Some of them, in my opinion, do deserve to be thrown away by society, but uh, to get better conduct by inmates. Well, yeah, I, I think anybody here would tell you, anybody in the chat, anybody listening, you know, in the platform after the fact. I mean, I'm 53 years old. I'm certainly not the same person I was when I was 20 years old. I mean, people change over time. And I think this is fa a fantastic legislation to protect people that maybe have been wrongfully convicted of these crimes. But for people maybe that have completely turned their lives around in prison and have become, you know, citizens that are making a difference in the lives of others and citizens that have come out and benefited others and you know pursued advanced degrees and things like that. I mean, this, I think, would also maybe give some of these people a chance or a second chance at getting out and living a productive life and benefiting society. I mean, do you think that that this bill would uh, help people maybe, you know, kind of get out and, and make, make their life into a positive in some way? That would, that would for a few of them. Um, uh, like I say, this is just kind of a last line of defense. Um, so if you have somebody who was involved in, say, a bank robbery where someone was killed in the process, they could be serving life in prison for that. Or if someone is an accomplice to homicide, they may not be the mastermind behind it. Um, they may not be the, the kind of evil person we throw away. I think Thomas Jefferson once said, uh, most people are convicted of crimes. Aside from a, a small handful who are truly evil people, most of them are at least in some ways redeemable. Uh, there was one other reason for putting this bill in, and that is just strictly cost. When you get inmates who are 65, 70, 75 years old, their health care costs really, really go up um, because you can't just send them out to a specialist. You have to have specialists who take an entire day off and get sent to the prison. So uh, it's not just a little, you know, doctor's visit. It's not just a house call. You have to find a specialist maybe from a couple hundred miles away and have them uh, brought up to New Hampshire, take the entire day off just to see these people. And they may have to see doctors, you know, they may have to see specialists multiple times per year. This is an enormous cost. 
And when you're looking at people who are in their 70s, um, the, the, the chances of them going out and reoffending are really, really slight after they've already served 25, 30, 40 years. Um, on top of that being very, very old um, and having these very, very high health care costs, um, we're always in this difficult budget crunch looking for ways to save money. And I don't, I don't think that taking a guy in their 70s, even if they were some kind of you know, mafia hitman 40 years ago, I don't see that, it, that it's, that it's um, justifying cost to the taxpayer to keep somebody behind bars when they're, they're having to see specialists all the time to keep themselves alive. And some people say, oh, well, why not just let them, why not just let them die in prison? Well, the courts have said you can't just let them die in prison. You have to keep sending specialists in sometimes a couple of times a month. And the, the costs of doing that are astronomical. Now, are, are there any other states that actually have laws like this already on the books? And if so, yeah, has it been effective? Um, so the New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union has um, looked this up. A lot of states have not automatic parole. Um, I think there were some states, that, maybe in the 70s, that had automatic parole. But they have automatic parole hearings in quite a few states. And when they've, uh, when they've researched this, what is the impact on crime after someone has served, you know, 30 years or some such thing? Um, there's no more deterring effect on, on existing criminals. Um, once these, uh, sentences get really extreme like that and the people who are actually released, people who are put out on parole, it's very, very rare that they go out and commit another violent crime. Now, I see that, that uh, there's a Zoom meeting coming up on March 3rd. I think it starts at 945 in the morning. I found that on one of the pages associated with your profile. My producer, Eric, has been posting that down into the uh, the chat here. If there are people in this live that happen to listen to this and they're from New Hampshire, what can they do to actually help you make this happen? And again, there will be people listening to this, you know, tomorrow and the next day as they download and listen to my show. So what can people in the state of New Hampshire do to help you? And can people in other states help you maybe make this happen? Um. Uh there are a couple things you can do. You can send an email to members of the House Criminal Justice Committee. Um, that's on the, the state's website, which is just House Criminal Justice Committee um, at leg.state.nh.us. And you can find that on the website. Another one is if you just go to, if you. I'm getting blasted with phone calls. <laughs> I don't need the phone, need the phone oh, call. No. never fails. It's all right. Go ahead. <laughs> Gencourt.state.nh.us, and you can click on the hearing. It's in the lower right-hand corner. You click on uh, hearings, and then you select March 3rd, and then criminal justice, and then you pull up HB 138, and you, you can just click on, if you're from New Hampshire, and just say that you support the bill, um, and I think there's four pages to click through, and then you know leave your, your name and the town that you're from, um, and they'll read that. They do read that off. I had another bill today that was um, reducing marijuana uh, penalties, and it was uh, something like seventy-two to six in favor of the bill for people signing the blue sheet through the through the state's website to do that. So that's just gencourt.state.nh.us. Hey, would you mind? I see a couple of good questions have come through my chat, and people want to ask questions. So I might scroll through and ask you a couple, if that's okay, if that would be okay with you. Um, there's one here that's a good question, actually. I saw it's from Two Peas in a Podcast, and the question is, is the jail system in New Hampshire a for-profit jail system? Um, in, in terms of being private prisons, I, I'm, I think that's one of the bills we come up with every year where we have a bipartisan coalition. I feel like we stopped prison privatization just a couple of years ago. Um, it, it doesn't save taxpayers much money. It saves about 3%. Um, and then you end up with, of course, private prison lobby. You already have the corrections unions to begin with. That you're fighting against for criminal justice reform, but to have the have private prison industry coming in and constantly lobbying against every single effort to end mandatory minimums. And they'll, 
Of course, they'll come to your legislators and they'll say, well, there's this one case in Pennsylvania in 1979 where they released a guy and then he went out and he stabbed somebody. And you're always going to have these fluke um, or very rare cases, statistically rare cases. And it's, it's, it's one of the reasons you don't want to have private prisons and one of the reasons you don't want to have a big oversized uh, prison industry um, is you don't want the political lobby because it's definitely a, it's a, it can be a corrupting influence in your state legislature. So I don't think that we have private prisons anymore. I'm not sure if we ever had a private prison in New Hampshire. Um, but I, I definitely don't believe in, I shouldn't say privatization, corporatization of prisons. Um, there, there are all kinds of services that can be privatized, but, um, you know, this is definitely a function of government. It's, it's something I, I don't think that there's a practical way to to outsource this. All right. Now, I, I guess if, if you could speak to everybody that's in the live right now and is going to listen after the fact, you know, why should the people of New Hampshire support this? If you could, you know, we, we've explained the bill a little bit. If you could explain it from like beginning to end, what's in this bill and why they should support it. Hopefully that'll maybe, you know, be enough to maybe help some people get on board and maybe call their representatives and do certain things to maybe, you know, help this thing, you know, move forward. So if you could just kind of, you know, just go out and speak to the people of New Hampshire and let them know why you think they should support this. I you know, that'd be great. For the 114 people currently serving life in prison, uh, without possibility of parole, and the 75 individuals who would become eligible later on, um, we know that there's a very high wrongful conviction rate, that, that there is still a problem with overcharging and over-sentencing of, of people, and we kind of need a last line of defense because the courts are not doing it. And there has, there has to be someone, if you're serving life in prison or someone you know is serving life in prison without possibility of parole, there has to be a last line of defense where human beings have freedom to examine the forensics, examine somebody's conduct while they were in prison, and uh, make a determination whether or not that person is really dangerous to society uh, or may have simply been wrongly convicted or oversentenced. All right. Now we've got about 10 minutes left and I would like to get the questions in a little bit. I may have my producer call in. He's actually been keeping track of the questions. He's got quite a few. Would you be able to answer a few if we had him call in? Would that be okay with you, Max, to, to bring him into the, into the call and have him ask you a few questions? Yeah. Okay, great. Go ahead, Eric. Why don't you call in and just hold for a second and then we'll get to those questions. We've got, you know, like I said, probably about 10 minutes, 10 minutes left. Um, now what, I guess what, you know, why, why is this, I guess, a passion of yours? I mean, you're in the state of New Hampshire, you know, this is something that obviously means something to you. Uh, is this, you know, purely a financial decision on your part? I mean, why, why have you kind of, you know, put your blood, sweat and tears behind this to, to make this happen for the inmates in New Hampshire? It's the injustice of seeing prosecutors target people who they know are innocent or, or target people who are just an easy, easy target where they can find a couple of emotional people on a jury and, and just let those two emotional jurors just kind of yell and scream at people for several hours until they can get a, a wrongful conviction out of somebody. Um, I mean, there's, there's certainly the, the, the cost component. It, I don't want to play that down. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did find, I got involved in local politics to try to save people money on their property taxes. And it was seeing that the that state mandates and federal mandates um, and state decisions were really what were driving up the cost of everything. So it, it, it's been kind of my desire to figure out ways to save people money on their property taxes and their overall state and local tax bill. Um, and this is definitely taking, taking and holding on to people who are no longer dangerous to society at, at spiraling out of control costs uh, is definitely an issue. But for me, seeing prosecutors get away with time and time again, throwing innocent people in prison, throwing the wrong person in prison, um, and following up on a lot of innocence projects cases um, to see how many people involved in the criminal justice system, forensic experts, not just uh, prosecutors, but, but public defenders, sometimes paid private defense attorneys, not uh, showing up for the uh, um, arraignment, um, seeing how many people, uh, police, sometimes the, the, the actual murderer shows up for trial and testifies against the, the, the bystander and gets the bystander wrongly convicted as happened in the Chad Evans case. And that, that what happens is 
uh, when the wrong person gets convicted, there's no possible way to go after the real killer. Uh, and um, there's no evidence that can come up when uh, the courts have said, hey, you know, the jury chose to believe the real killer and, and not this innocent bystander. I, I got to tell you, you know, it's, I, I me, tell you, you know, oh, a little echo there. It's, it's to me, it's terribly chilling to think that we, you know, that you actually have prosecutors that are throwing people in prison when maybe they know that these people did not actually commit the crime. I mean, that's a terrifying thought to, to hear, because really, in my in my mind, that shakes your opinion of the entire justice system, because as Americans, we need to have confidence that our justice system is doing the right thing. And if people are committing crimes, they should be punished for their crimes. But to, to get people in prison when you possibly knowingly know that maybe they did not commit the crime is really just a terrifying thought for me. And I'm sure for all the listeners that are here. And, you know, for, for one, one thing I've always thought about, you know, myself and my life, and it's the way I live my life. I mean, if you've got nothing to hide, then you should be willing to allow people to open something up again, take another look under the hood, make sure that everything was done right the first time. And if mistakes were made, it makes sense in this country for us to right those wrongs and get these people out of prison. I mean, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to spend you know, 25 years of my life in prison for a crime I did not commit and have no chance whatsoever to be heard again, to have someone look at, you know, the evidence again, to have someone at least listen to my story and have a chance to maybe right a wrong that's happened. I mean, for me, if, if one person can be saved by something like this, then to me, it's worth it for the entire, you know, program. Because again, if, if someone is losing their entire life and they're innocent, they deserve and they should have the right to have someone look at that and make sure that they are legitimately behind prison. And if they are not, they need to be out. So, I mean, I'm really happy that you are putting this forward. And, you know, for myself over the years, I think I've changed the way sometimes I've thought about things. And for me, at this point in my life, I think it is a necessity in our society to make sure that we're getting things right. And if we made a mistake and that mistake is visible, then the mistake needs to be corrected. So, I, I mean, I really applaud you for putting this forward. I hope that this happens in the state of New Hampshire. Now, if, if this happens, I mean, I, I guess what is the process for the entire, you know, bill going through? I mean, it's, it's already been introduced. There are hearings. I think it is this Wednesday. Now, how long might it take for this to actually happen? And if so, when could potentially be maybe the first people actually have their parole hearings if this does happen? Um, if this happens, uh, the Criminal Justice Committee could be executing it the same day, that same afternoon, as late as, uh, you know, 3, 30, 4 o'clock, potentially. But wow. usually it's another week or two, and then it goes to the House floor and we vote on it. If the Criminal Justice Committee agrees on the need to do this, then it'll, it will probably pass the House floor, go to the Senate. And I'm I'm pretty sure that, that the Senate, the Senate usually approves whatever the House comes up with, as long as it's not uh, legalization of marijuana or legalization of of anything uh, that's going to get on the front page, but potentially um, by the end of the year, I, I think if, if if we're lucky, fingers crossed, and if the criminal justice committee goes along with it, then it you could potentially see parole hearings by the end of the year. Well, that's great. I know you have a lot of supporters in this room right now, and we're going to be rooting for this thing to happen. So hopefully, in some small way, this platform maybe helps a little bit by helping you get the word out. And, you know, like I said, I, I wanted to keep this podcast well within an hour because, again, longer podcasts tend to scare people away sometimes. So I'm going to maybe do five minutes worth of questions from Eric. He's my producer. He joined us. He's been watching the chat. So, Eric, if you've maybe got, like, say, maybe three or four good questions for Max to answer, why don't you begin asking those and then we'll start to wrap this show up so we can get it out and get it published. All right. Um, the first question comes from our pod being friend, Jess Duck out in Colorado. How traumatic is it for the person to be let out after that much time in prison? The world has changed so much in the last 25 years. That's a good question. Uh, Kirk Blood. Yeah, that's uh, actually one of the Kirk Bloodsworth takes that question sometimes. Um, and he said that when he was first let out after, I think, 20 years um, for wrongful, wrongful conviction, he was facing the death penalty. And it was just the light in his eyes and seeing the world, how it changed. He'd heard rumors about how much the world had changed, uh, but he couldn't really believe it. He saw a whole bunch of movies and he got up the, his first night out. He got up in the middle of the night 
and it was black, completely pitch black. He didn't think to turn on the light. He walked over to where his, his toilet used to be and he was, he peed on the lamp and he, he, it, it was only then when he turned the light on, he saw that he peed on the lamp that he, it finally hit him that he was free now and he was no longer in prison and he's no longer facing the death penalty. It was just an, it was amazing. It, it was, a. Uh, it was uh, so difficult at first, and sometimes it takes two or three months for, for, for people who are let out to become acclimatized to life in the real world. Well, that's a good answer, and that's an amazing story. So thank you for that answer. All right, Eric, if you have a couple more, why don't we get those out and give Max a chance to answer? Um, the next question comes from our other podcast friend, Cummings' is Culture from Alabama. I don't agree with PR bonds. Does New Hampshire still have cash bonds or do they do PR bonds? Um, I'm not sure. I I don't want to uh, um, guess at an answer and and possibly steer you wrong. Um, I I know that we're doing a lot of bail reform and we're doing a lot of parole reform right now, but uh, I'll have to wait and see what the the legislation is and how they change the system. They change it every year. Um, before I, I give a definitive answer. Um, and, um, and I think Mike Tampa Bay had a good question. You know, and he's another podcast friend from Florida. Um, I'm scrolling through the chat and looking for it now. Um, hang on a moment. Yeah. Just take a minute, a minute to find that. So, you know, for everybody in right now, you know, I know that we've got a lot of people in the live and it's been a you know, very, um, hard but go ahead, Eric, you haven't found it. Um, you know, and Mike Tampa Bay, you know, ha- has a question like about lobbyist pressure in the behest of special needs. Uh, special needs inmates. So, some, some along those lines. And then, you know, associated with like the lobbyist pressure in it. So I think maybe what you're saying is our our lobby our lobbyists involved in pressuring what this this to happen to inmates or I'm not sure if I understand Tampa Bay's question. Okay, I see he he made a comment down below. He said in federal and state fun, is federal and state funding a pressure for some politicians as they as as they are being lobbyists. Yes. The in, in the Senate, special interest money controls it because the districts are so large that it can cost anywhere from one hundred thousand to three hundred thousand dollars to win. We've had we've had people spend over three hundred thousand dollars for a state Senate seat. I mean, congressional seats used to be three hundred thousand um, dollars. Now they run into the millions um, at the state house level. It's different. My district is uh, about 20,000 people or so. It's not very big. And most state house districts are only 3,000 or 6,000 people. So the, the cost of running for state house is only 500 or $1,000 for most races. And I, I don't spend very much myself. So uh, in the state house, what, what's different is that the criminal justice committee usually gets retired cops. And retired cops have been bombarded with, you know, these guys were serving in the 70s and 80s and 90s during the tough on crime era. And if, if you have even one cop you've ever met a fellow cop who's been killed in the line of duty by anyone who's ever been released, even on a nonviolent marijuana or firearms offense. Um, It, it definitely colors your view of the world and they really tend to err on the side of uh, keeping convicts locked up and they want to have a lot more control over drug offenders. And, And when you hear the police chiefs association and the prosecutors, county attorneys, the, um, when you hear retired cops uh, come in, they have very definite, strong opinions. And those opinions, and especially the ones who are serving on the Criminal Justice Committee, those opinions are not going to sway. All right, Eric, why don't we do one more question, if you have one, and then we'll wrap this thing up. Um, I think um, two peas in um, – I'm trying to read that pro- podcast name. Two peas in a podcast um, asked, what would it – would it make more sense to – allow the system to review life sentences after 25 years as stated and bring them up to current laws and minimum maximum sentences. In essence, the same crime 25 years ago may not have current length max term in today's society in the justice system. Well, most of what we're talking about in New Hampshire is life without parole for murder. It's usually first degree murder. And 
the, the problem there is, although there are a lot of cold-blooded murderers who deserve life in prison, many of these cases we're finding it's not only the wrong person, but it's somebody who is who committed a lesser offense. They may have been an accomplice or maybe second degree or negligent or reckless homicide. And um, uh, they are um, terribly over-sentenced. And they may deserve 10 or 20 years. But a, a big part of parole review is just making sure this is somebody who has already kind of done their time. They've done their their you know reform. They've done the work themselves to turn themselves around and turn them into a productive member of society before we let them out. But you really have to have human beings at the parole hearing interviewing that person um, and getting the opinion of the corrections uh, officers who work with them. I got to say, before we let you go, Max, you've got a pretty big fan in there of uh, Mike from Tampa Bay. He's saying, I'm definitely a fan. I'd like to see this guy run for president after Trump and Junior. So you've got a good fan there, Mike from Tampa Bay. Now, if I did read correctly, I believe you did run for president at one point. Is that accurate? I put my name in. Um, I didn't run very actively, but I, I wanted to bring the troops home from the Middle East. And that was my primary motivation. That's what I campaigned on. Uh, un unfortunately, the Libertarian Party, which I was involved with for many, many years, has changed in the last five or six years, and it's no longer the party of, you know, criminal justice reform and uh, protecting our constitutional rights. It's really become, I think it's taken over by anarcho-socialists and anarcho-communists and a lot of people from Antifa, and uh, whole state chapters have been taken over, and they don't tolerate um, dissent. So I support secure borders and I don't believe in sanctuary cities and just, just, uh, putting a citizen's petition on the ballot saying, you know, we need to stop sanctuary cities, just putting the question out there, uh, without any of these people contacting me, I was pretty publicly berated for, uh, and called a fascist and every other terrible thing by people who'd never talked to me before yeah. just for saying, why micromanage police? Why not just let police do their jobs? If you ha if you if police stop somebody and they're an illegal immigrant and they're obviously involved with possibly involved with uh, violent uh, you know Latin American drug cartels or gangs, um, why not let the police officer do a background search? Why not let them enforce federal immigration laws? Why would you interfere with the job that police are doing? I mean, it all seems like common sense, doesn't it? I, in, in this show, I'll tell you, you're preaching to the choir. You have a lot of people in here that support exactly what you're saying. And to me, it makes complete sense. And I think, unfortunately, our country has kind of lost their way quite a bit, you know, recently. And I'm hoping that we can get back on track. But we certainly need more people like you in positions in this country where, you know, hopefully you'll be fighting the good fight for the things that so many of us believe in. So I've got to say, you know, Max, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Um for those of you that are in here listening, you know, Max Abramson, he's a New Hampshire, he's a member of the New Hampshire House of Representatives. He's got HB 138 on the table, and this will hopefully provide some relief to maybe some people in New Hampshire that have been wrongly conv convicted of murder and are currently serving life without the possibility of parole. So for those of you that are just coming in now, if this happens to go forward, then every person that's been convicted of murder and has received a sentence of life without the possibility of parole in the state of New Hampshire will get a parole hearing once they've served 25 years of their sentence. And to me, it makes complete sense. It's humane. It's smart. You're making sure that you're coming in and doing the right thing by these people. You're, you're looking to weed out wrongful convictions. And in the case where you have people that might be 75 or 80 years old, you may be releasing people that are no longer a danger to the state, but can also save the taxpayers a lot of money. So this obviously was a very well thought out, well planned uh, bill, and we wish you the very best. I, I I'm going to be keeping track of this, and if we hear on this show that uh, everything goes forward and it's been passed, we'd love to have you back on again sometime to talk again about maybe this bill and some other things you have going on. Sure thing. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and. <laughs> For the John DeVito Show, we're going to wrap this up. We're at about 54 minutes. I want to thank everybody that has come into the live studio. Make sure if you could, you'll go out and share this uh, podcast on your platforms. Get it out there so people can hear it. I'm going to be getting this out to my sources in New Hampshire. So hopefully we can do some good and maybe help 
some of the people that have been trapped in the criminal justice system in the state of New Hampshire and have been wrongfully committed. So for all of my listeners, I want to thank all of you for coming in. Eric Kirk, thank you. And Max Abramson, thank you again very much for joining us. And I hope you all have a great night. So thank you again. Take care now. Thank you.